Well, brothers and sisters, I wonder if we can turn to that short letter Paul wrote under inspiration of the Spirit to Philemon. Now, you'll probably know that in our New Testament, the letters of Paul are not grouped in order of composition. They are in order of length. So the longest letter we have is to the Romans and the next longest we call the first Corinthians of the next long and so on. And Philemon, therefore, coming at the end, before the letter to the Hebrews, which may or may not have been written by Paul, is the shortest of the letters. And hopefully the exhortation will be in proportion, therefore, to the length of this letter. Now, it seems slightly strange, doesn't it, to have such a letter in God's word. Paul is not tackling <clears throat> the big issues, the death and resurrection of the Lord <coughs> Jesus Christ, the need for faith, for belief, for baptism, or the need to exhibit, particularly, although this comes up, that love that Christ first showed, that we should show in our lives. It seems to be almost a letter about a, a domestic dispute, doesn't it? In the Roman world, the Greco-Roman world, slavery was the norm. Any household worth its salt had a slave, sometimes quite a number. When I was researching on the internet some years ago for a Bible class address, I came across the, the will of a rich Roman who had left on his death in his will something like 15,800 slaves. Presumably his estates were spread around, um, not just in Rome itself. But abhorrent though slavery is to our way of thinking, in their world it was, I say, the norm. Now, there aren't probably any in this room who think to themselves, well, I'll do away without my car. I don't really need a fridge and a freezer. I don't need a washing machine. I don't really need a dishwasher. I don't really need gas, electricity. I don't even need the seven Trent to supply me with water. I'll cope on my own. Now, no one realistically would, would, would say, I'm giving those up, would they? And so no citizen with a household of slaves would think, oh, I'll free my slaves. They were like our white goods, like our utilities. And that's how, how they were viewed in the Roman world. But this letter, uh, and I'm not going to go in through detail, because I want to bring out the exhortation in it, that when we prepare ourselves, or as we prepare ourselves to take bread and wine, we may receive that word of comfort and strengthening from the word of God. We've got basically three characters. We've got the householder, the slave owner Philemon. We've got Onesimus, and those who have done Greek will tell me that, in fact, it should be pronounced Onesimus, but I shall continue with Onesimus, as I think that's more familiar to our ears. And Onesimus had run away, so he and Philemon were at loggerheads. Like Philemon was a, a brother in the Lord Jesus Christ. Initially, Onesimus wasn't, but had met Paul and was subsequently <coughs> converted. And we have final, finally the character of Paul. And he, in this dispute, is really the intercessor, <coughs> the mediator between these two. And I'm not, I suppose I am dropping little hints why God has, in his infinite wisdom, seen fit to include in our Bibles a little letter concerning a domestic dispute. For we have come to remember, haven't we, this morning, the intermediary, the, 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 the mediator of a new covenant, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're looking at that principle of one standing between, yet related to both, in the letter, in the natural sense, to Philemon. One of the interesting things of, 
Paul, and there are many features of his letters. If you go to verse 4, you'll see this illustrated very easily. He often starts his letters after the initial sort of introduction, because letters then were written in a different style to ours. I mean, we normally write a letter with the recipient's name at the top and your name at the bottom, which always... I think the Greek idea would seem better because if you have to receive a letter and open it up, you know it's addressed to you. If it's the envelope, don't you? You want to know who it's from. However, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, that's who it's from. Verse 4, Paul writing in the first person. I thank God, making mention of the always in my prayers. And quite often when we come across Paul and his prayers, he expands. So we know... It's not usually the next verse, it is here. So we know what he is praying about for that ecclesia, or in this case, for that individual. Verse 5. Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus, and toward all, the revisers, all the saints, or all saints. So presumably the prayer was a thanks to God, for this person, Philemon, that he may carry on in this manner of life. And the attitude Philemon has shown, he's got the verse, the end of verse 2, the ecclesia in his house. He's got love and faith toward our Lord Jesus and toward the saints. What the letter is really about is that attitude should be shown towards your new brother, Onesimus. It was interesting, uh, as Brother Richard read verse 8, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, um, it was command. And that's what it means. Paul was a divinely appointed apostle of the Lord Jesus, appointed by God through the work of Jesus. And he had the right to command, but he didn't use that right in this letter. He said, I could have enjoined. Enjoin comes from the family of English words, the most common sort of in that family is probably an injunction, where a court orders you to do something or not to do something. It's a command, an order. I could have ordered you, he says, but in verse 10, I beseech thee for my son or my child, Onesimus, whom I have begotten, given birth to almost, in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now is profitable to thee and to me. When we come across the word um, profitable, of course, it's a play on the name of Onesimus, which means something like um, useful or profitable. He was Mr. Useful, and it was a common name in that part of the world then. In fact, one of the early bishops of Ephesus was a man called Onesimus. Some have sort of postulated that he was this Onesimus, but it was a common name, so therefore we can't always be sure but coming back to um verse six one thing i want to pick up that the communication of thy faith now the word communication in the revised version has fellowship and the original is usually translated fellowship now to us fellowship is a sort of you're in fellowship or you're out of fellowship it's a warm it's a comfortable world isn't it but perhaps a different word might help us to see what we are looking at in this common ship, communication, having in common. It can mean, and it did mean in the Greek world, in the Roman world, uh, rather than fellowship, partnership. There are quite a few letters which speak of someone and his partners in a business venture. And it's a reminder to us that we've come th this morning that we are partners, not only with each other, 
with the Lord Jesus Christ. And our, and I have to put it in inverted commas, business venture, the business we're in, is living the truth and preaching the hope of Israel. We're in, for want of a better way of putting it, we're in the kingdom business together as an ecclesia. And individual differences must be set aside if we're to be effective partners with the Lord Jesus Christ. So in terms of Paul writing to Philemon, he's really saying to Philemon, look, you, I could command you, but I'm not going to. Your, your track record of having the ecclesia in your house, of exhibiting faith and love, Really, Philemon says it all. Now, perhaps some of the younger ones haven't, but most of us have been to business meetings where the going gets hard. <laughs> and, you know, there are differences of opinion, and they're strongly felt, and perhaps even more strongly expressed. But if the vote goes against you, or against me, we are in this partnership with Jesus. We have got to set aside personal feelings. And can you imagine, from Philemon's viewpoint, a slave owner had absolute right over a slave. He could abuse them, he could put them to death. And in fact, runaway slaves were quite often crucified when they got back to, if they were recaptured. <coughs> Or they could be whipped, they could be lashed, they could all sorts of things. And no one cared. I mean, like taking your fridge out and smashing it up. It's maybe irritate the neighbours. But, you know, it's no big deal. And, and that's how it was viewed. But Onesimus was now a fellow brother. He was a brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. But look at Philemon. If one man in a town, possibly a prominent man, with his house at least big enough to accommodate an ecclesial gathering, if he started being lenient with runaway slaves, could you imagine what would happen? The neighbour saying, oh, it's the thin end of the wedge, isn't it, here? What's going to happen? All these slaves are going to run away because they know be well You know, there was pressure on Philemon, and don't forget that in this letter. But verse 9, just to repeat that. Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee. Philemon could have taken him back with a sort of, I'll oh, forgive but not forget attitude, which we sometimes see in people on the television. But forgiveness has to be complete. Reconciliation has to be complete. You think what our father could hold against us in terms of our manner of life, our evil and sinful thoughts. And many of those after our baptism, where we thought less than we should have over a brother and sister in our, our fellowship. But God's forgiveness is full. It's free, isn't it? And if Philemon could not understand in the natural sense this forgiveness and reconciliation how could he understand it in the spiritual sense the two sit very closely together our natural and our spiritual just as in our for those of us who are married in our married lives if we're unfaithful to our partner in the natural things, how can really we be faithful in the things of the Lord Jesus, our future king on the earth? Yet you know, the two don't sit side by side, do they? If we're unfaithful in our sort of natural world and pretend to be faithful in our spiritual world. Verse 15, um, coming into this argument, but I don't want to labour because you, you, you will all know this, this, this um, letter well. For he uses the word for perhaps, I think it's the ESV, it might be one of the others says, maybe. 
uh, Onesimus departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever now as a brother of course so you can see what Paul is saying God is working in our lives sometimes it's obvious but I, I would suspect if you're like me many times it isn't obvious how the eternal spirit the almighty God is working in my life but we know full well that he is. And Paul is suggesting to Philemon, you know, perhaps this is God working in your life, that you've lost a servant and gained a brother. And how much more rewarding is that for Philemon? You know, that's what Paul is saying to him. And verse 17 if thou count me therefore a partner, I mentioned about partnership, receive him <laughs> as myself. And there are lots and lots of passages you can come to with this principle. If you receive somebody, you're actually receiving somebody else. You're going to say, that sounds a bit confusing, but I won't turn to the passage. But I'm thinking in John 13, Jesus says, he who receives me, receives the Almighty. And do you remember that the third of the parables in Matthew 25, those, the sheep and the goats, those who had given simple things like a glass of water or visited the sick. And Jesus said, if you've done it to one of these, you've done it to me. And you can see the principle working out in Philemon how Paul is getting his mind into that frame of mind. If you receive Onesimus back, you're receiving me, Paul. And it's not written here, but it's, it's unwritten, isn't it, that one who receives God's chosen vessel, his apostle, receives God, receives the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you turn, please, to the first letter of John, chapter 4? <coughs> Coming after <coughs> Hebrews and James, two letters of Peter. First of John, chapter 4. And this is really where we're coming to, in the breaking of bread. I'm trying to sort of draw it into your minds to, to close off the, the address. Verse 19. Uh, sorry, verse 20. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, John writes, he is a liar. And apply that to Philemon. If he says, yes, I, I, I love God, but I don't like that Onesimus who ran away and caused me a lot of aggravation. I had to replace him at short notice and it cost me money. The two go so closely together, don't they? You can't separate. He is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God, loveth his brother. And you can see now, can't you, why a short little letter about a runaway slave is in the Word of God. It's directing us to something far greater that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Mediator. From Adam onwards, man has run away, turned his back on the Almighty. But we return, don't we, because of the mediator. The bread and the wine reminds us of the mediator between God and man. In fact, if we turn to First um, Timothy chapter 2, you'll, you'll, you'll probably have the passage in mind already in verse 5.
First Timothy chapter two uh, and verse five. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, or sorry, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. I always think that verse rather destroys any concept of the Trinity because Christ is an intermediary, he's not God, but he though God's son, he's not man, though he shares our nature. He's a human being in that sense. He's related to both parties. And we have come to remember that mediatorship. How it can't remain in our minds as a sort of rather nice, abstract principle. If it doesn't enter our thinking and our lives, we've lost the lesson of Philemon. And can you turn just for one little last reference in Philemon? And it's verse 16. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a slave, a brother beloved. That is how you are to receive him, as a beloved brother. And I want to end on this point for this very simple and straightforward reason. Philemon could grudgingly accept back Onesimus, but Paul says, receive him wholeheartedly as a brother. And Philemon is an encouragement to us. We don't just do enough for the Lord. Let's sort of tick, the, oh yeah, we, we, we come to the meeting, we come to the lectures, uh, mainly. We sort of struggle a bit with the Bible class, perhaps, but one of us go. Our lives are not to be limited. They are to be wholehearted. For we have before us set a hope for we are fellow heirs, joint heirs, with the Lord Jesus Christ to that future upon the earth. And if that isn't sort of getting excited about, if that isn't worth working for, there is nothing left in our lives 